Thank you very much indeed for coming along to the Terry Lions meeting. Today we have our speaker, Christian Michel, who's always good value. And this, uh, this time he's going to talk on the topic, Who is the People? Thank you very much, um, David, and thank you all for uh, attending. It's nice to see uh, familiar faces and to see people I do not yet know. And um, yes, yeah, so a question I was going to ask uh, today is, uh, who is the people? And starting with an understanding of uh, politics. And what politics is about, the function of politics, is about constructing an enemy. And it is to identify an enemy, a them, which in turns um, constitutes a we. Uh, in political life, we are the people who oppose the same enemy. And we are united politically uh, in as much as we fight together. Now, of course, there are other uh, types of conflicts in uh, society. You have conflicts of interest, you have competition uh, in business, in sport, but in business as in sport, you have sportsmanship, in business you have people who uh, can be competitors, they can, be, they can cooperate together, uh, and that line is very easily crossed. In other words, you have companies that say, I don't know, Renault one day uh, could acquire Volkswagen or Fiat could uh, be acquired by General Motors. Today they are competitors, tomorrow they could be uh, merging. In football, you know better than I do, I don't follow these things very closely, but you know that players for Arsenal um, who fight against Chelsea or Manchester United, tomorrow will be fighting for Manchester United or Chelsea. So the one thing that separates politics from all these rivalries, competition, and so on, is the fact that the differences are irreconcilable. In other words, you will never see uh, Lib Dems governing together with uh, UKIP. You will never see uh, a socialist party uh, making an alliance with a far-right uh, party. And that sort of conflict, that sort of opposition, of course runs across the whole of history. But it's being put into theory by a, a philosopher, a German philosopher in the 1930s called Carl Schmitt. And Carl Schmitt wrote a book, Concept of the Political. Um, he was very close to the Nazi party, actually he joined the Nazi party in the 1930s. And then, thankfully for his reputation and posterity for him, he was expelled from the Nazi party. <laughs> Too right wing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. And this indignity actually was his salvation. And um, he continued to produce in, you know, up until the 1950s and so on. But what is more interesting is that what he, what he defined as being the opposition, the um, radical opposition, was horizontal. It was an opposition between nations, between peoples, between ethnical groups between cultures. It was horizontal. And you had in the 1970s an interesting re-adaptation both of Karl Schmitt and of Karl Marx of, by uh, the left, and especially by two authors, two thinkers on the left, who were Ernesto Laclau, died a couple of years ago, and his companion, um, Chantal Mouffe, who still teaches and um, lectures at uh, Westminster University. And they used the same concept, but in the other uh, dimension, rather than being a conflict, irreconcilable conflict between nations uh, geographically with borders and so on, it was a conflict between classes. It was a vertical conflict. It was the people at the top and the people at the bottom. It was the um, owners of capital and the uh, workers. It was the 1% and the 99%, as we have, we have heard uh, recently, and so on. And, and of course, this distinction between the exploiters and the exploited was uh, one that they borrowed not only from Karl Schmitt, but they borrowed in, in terms of you know, conflicts and, and so on, irreconcilable conflicts, but it is one that we took from Karl Marx. And the separate individuals, wrote Karl Marx in the German, uh, German ideology, 
the separate individuals form a class only insofar as they have to carry on a common battle against <coughs> another class. Otherwise, they are on hostile terms with each other as competitors. So it's only when you identify the enemy, the exploiters, that you become a group, a political group. Otherwise, you are just individuals fighting and so on. And um, the conflicts of the 20th century, these horrible, terrible, murderous conflicts of the 20th century were fought on both these fronts. There was the, of course, ethnic, geographical, nationalist, whatever you call them, horizontal conflicts that Carl Schmitt sort of described. And then you, have, you had, at the same time, the vertical conflicts, socialist revolutions and all these sort of things. It gave you both these um, uh, world, I mean, two, world, two world wars and so on. It gave you the Russian Revolution. It gave you all sorts of conflicts in, um, everywhere in, in the world. In the 1980s, suddenly dawned a new hope for humanity, a great hope that we could pacify both the horizontal and the vertical conflicts, both the nationalist oppositions and the economic opposition. It was the time when the Soviet Union was in terminal decline. It was the time when China started joining the world economy with Deng Xiaoping's reform. It was a time when the European Union established fundamentally peace within Europe. And globalization was emerging. Globalization was starting linking together all economies of the world in a sort of web of what Montesquieu used to call du commerce, gentle trade. And the opportunity cost of wars was, of course, rising. Because if you have, on the one hand, the possibility of trading and more prosperity and so on, breaking this and going to war is not only the cost of a war, but it is the cost of what you are forfeiting in terms of the integration in a more prosperous uh, world. And at the same time, locally, you had the spread of social democracies, the spread of a welfare state, which was, I mean, which hopefully would assuage the conflicts within each polity, within each country. Um, it was the time when Francis Fukuyama wrote, as you recall, uh, this famous article in Foreign Affairs, which became a book in 1992, The End of History and the Last Man. That's it. We have achieved it. <coughs> there is nothing that we can imagine and conceive that would be better than the sort of Scandinavian type welfare state and globalization. Even on the left, there was a fantastic book by Michael Hart and Tony Negri called Empire, a completely mad book, putting everything Spinoza and you know, everybody into it, but which said exactly the same thing. Globalization is unsurpassable. It will happen. And that was someone who was on the radical left and saying we have to deal with it. And that book, Empire, sold 20 million copies. I mean, a book you know, that thick, full of footnotes, 20 million copies. Um, and then it was followed, of course, by two other books of the same ilk, Multitude and a Commonwealth. And that movement, globalization and so on, took on another dimension with, of course, the technological revolution a technological revolution that consolidated globalization, internet and all that, that could go further towards the pacification that I was mentioning. After steam and electricity, 
It was sometimes called the third industrial revolution, the greatest transformation of humanity, possibly bringing the greatest transformation of humanity since the domestication of fire. That's how it was presented. It was something transformative, something enormous. Um, transhumanism was uh, sort of um, accreted to that and talking about humanity 2.0. Humanity was happily motoring towards that bright future when a wheel fell off. When we are living through a momentous revolution, forgetting that all revolutions elicit a counter-revolution. And the main counter-revolutionaries today are so-called populist movement. Populist movement. The name is a direct translation of Russian word, which is Narodniki. And the Narodniki were a group of intellectuals in Russia in the 19th century going around the countryside, pestering villagers, and telling them, you should resist that movement towards westernization, that movement that came from the elite, the intellectual elite in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, in other cities, that aristocratic, bourgeois, intellectual elite that spoke French at home <laughs> and wanted to import all these mad ideas of industrialization and so on. People living in city. People were definitely against the decent farmer, hardworking peasants, people who live the solidarity of village life, people who continue the tradition that for 1,000 years had fashioned the Russian soul. And the people who were destroying all that sort of culture were the aristocrats, were the bourgeoisie, influenced by the West. That is what they were resisting. You would think that the poor, the people, being not the elite, would want change. If you live in sort of dire conditions, what have you got to lose? You want to embrace something that would be new. You want progress. And we tend to think that, quite the reverse, poverty is the driver, the ferment of populism. Well, it may be in Greece, but not necessarily in other places. In <coughs> Portugal, for instance, you don't have a strong populist movement. We tend to think that unemployment fosters populism. But Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Britain have low unemployment. And they have very strong populist movement. You tend to think that populism results from stagnation, no future. My children would not have a, the same standard of life that I have. And yet, that could explain populism in France, but not in Poland, where you continue to have strong economic growth. Would inequality create populism? Well, yes, you have high inequality in places like the United States and the United Kingdom, where you have very strong populist movement again. But France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, where they are very strong populist movement, have very low Gini. The Gini coefficient being what economists use to measure inequality. We hear that populists represent those that have a vote but not a voice. That is a slogan of the populist movement in Spain called Podemos, we can. Well, okay, we listen. 
We listen to people who have a voice. But what is it that we have to say? For it seems that the only message that populists convey, spread, is we don't like the future. There is a resistance to change. We don't know the future, nobody knows. But we know we don't like to go there. It's the same sort of resistance against the future that the Narodniki were preaching in Russia. Changing conditions is something that human beings have always had a great apprehension for. Our human brain has been wired by thousands and thousands and thousands of years living in the savannah, living in very precarious conditions. We were nomads then. We didn't have capital, just a bit of knowledge. And that knowledge was very specific to the place where we were living. This is where you find the water that is drinkable. These sort of plants are edible. Those are not. Don't go there, you'll be ambushed by tigers. And this is where you find praise. This is where the hunt takes place, and so on. And that was passed on generation after generations by the elders. You respect a tradition, you follow tradition, because if you didn't, if you didn't, you took risks that without the accumulated food and capital and so on, would endanger the whole tribe. Modernity reversed all that. Modernity happened when we were rich enough that we could experiment with life. Societies could try new things. And if it didn't work, OK, we have wasted a lot of capital, time, efforts. But hey, we are rich enough. We can continue experimenting. But change is costly. Change is costly for many people. It disrupts the establishment. And the people in power don't like it. You have bankruptcies resulting in misery for many people who precisely do not have the accumulated capital, accumulated wealth, and so on, where they could reconstruct easily their lives, unemployment, and so on. The cost is not only economic. The cost is psychological. When change is driven by the market, there is a feeling that we are not in control. There is a feeling that they are, they are these mysterious forces that are pushing us in different directions at great cost to ourselves. And that doesn't give confidence to many people. We would prefer that they be a great helmsman, a conducator, a guide, a führer, who would know the map, who would know where he is taking us. But that is not what globalization is saying. There is no one who is sort of piloting the ship. International trade means also a loss of control of states over the economy, a loss of control of democracy over the future. And that also is something that goes against the grain of all we have been taught since the 19th century about how our societies should govern their affairs. And then with trade comes other changes in culture, foreign culture, cinema, arts, soft power. All that is brought about by trade. And Plato was famously, you know, advising Athenians and the colonies that he had set and so on, saying, you don't want to trade with foreigners. Leave that to, you know, the Metekos and so on. The Narodniki believed in the deleterious influence that came with foreign trade. They wanted to shield Russia from Western values, and the Western values especially of the Enlightenment, for, in their opinion, 
there was something deeper, something purer than science and reason, some religious, mystical truth that was buried in the Russian soul. And for Narodniki at the time, as for many populists today, they believe that the ruling classes are guilty in front of the people, before the people, and should, have forgiven, should ask forgiveness for having introduced all these foreign elements in our culture, American consumerism, Islam, values that are not in the sort of long-established Christian tradition of our Western societies. Our modern populists are not only against change, like conservatives, they are actually reactionaries. They want to return to the past. They don't want to conserve what exists, which they believe is already corrupted. They want to go back to the 1950s, to the 1960s. Look, I mean, here Trump, his slogan was, make America great again. Now, a progressive leader would have said, let's make America greater than she's ever been. No. Harking back to the past. Corbyn, read his manifesto. I mean, you know, renationalizing, renationalizing uh, railways, water companies, all these sort of things. Le Pen, you know, going back to the 1950s, abolish all what has been done. So, you see where it goes. This reactionary mentality is understandable if you consider the, who are the people, why they are buying this, why they are accepting this discourse of let's back, let's go back to the past. Well, one of the reasons is that they are old. <laughs> and if you look, at you know, all the surveys of populist movement around the world, you see that it is driven by gray hair. 64%. Wisdom, experience. <laughs> I'm old myself. I have gray hair myself. But hey, I don't think that the future is bad. 64% of pensioners voted for leave in the Brexit referendum. The under 25s were only 29% voting for leave. In the USA, 54% of the over 65 voted for Trump. And you know that he didn't even get 50% of the total population as you know, supporting him. Um, he received only 35% of the 1829 class age. Modern populists are also uneducated. 54% of people who do not have a university education <clears throat> voted for Trump. It's even more striking in Britain. 70% of the people of voters who have only GCSE voted leave, whereas 68% with a university education, vote to remain. If you are young, if you are educated, you live in cities where the action is, where innovation emerge, where culture lives. You want to live in cities where you mix up with all sorts of people. You mingle with all categories of people. And that effervescence of cities was the very, very reason why Narodniki opposed them. Cities are the birthplace of the new. And if you uphold tradition, you are probably not going to be comfortable in big cities. In the US elections, stunningly, stunningly, I'm not making this up, the 37 larger cities, one, two, three, four, voted against Trump. The first city that gave a majority to Trump is one called Virginia Springs. 
I have no idea where it is. <laughs> British Airways doesn't fly there. Maybe in Virginia. <laughs> Maybe in Virginia. Um, I mean, New York, 87% voted against Trump. Philadelphia, 85%. Denver, 75%. And so on. Now, in Turkey, in the recent referendum that Erdogan, Erdogan has organized and so on, the three largest cities voted massively against this populist referendum. Istanbul, the city of which he was a mayor, and apparently a good mayor. Ankara, the capital, the political capital, is mayor. They all voted against this populist referendum. Of course, a Brexit. London, 60% voted against Brexit. Manchester, Bristol, Liverpool, only Birmingham gave a very tiny majority in favor of uh, Brexit. In France, in the recent election, a week ago, I mean, the 10 largest cities in France <coughs> voted by an even more, an even larger majority against Le Pen. And uh, Paris voted for Macron, actually, against Le Pen at more than 90%, 90.6%. And, um, okay, I'm quoting all these figures. Why? What do they tell us? Well, the old vertical divide between capitalists and workers becomes less and less pertinent. Because you see big punters behind Trump. You see big punters, people with money behind Brexit, behind Putin, behind Orban in Hungary, Kaczynski in Poland, um, and backing exactly the same parties. You have people who are the unemployed, people who are the poor, people who are the exploited in that sort of Marxist um, sort of um, people who used to vote socialist and to support hard left parties a decade ago. And now they are looking inward and backward. How is it possible? How is it possible that you no longer have this sort of division, sort of you know, right, left, and things like that. Well, because if you look at their manifestos, it's more or less the same. They are protectionist. They are looking at the past. They are protectionist culturally, economically, socially. Nationalists no longer threaten to cross these borders and invade neighbors. Well, Putin, maybe. <laughs> Nationalists now want to reinforce borders and they help each other erecting walls. Trump, Putin, Farage, Mélenchon, the left in France and so on, all the others. They want countries to build walls around themselves. Even Corbyn is not the internationalist that, for instance, Attlee was. Le Pen has given names to this new opposition, to this new front line. And that front line cuts across, runs between globalists and patriots. And in a way, she's right. In a way, the patriots are right. We want to associate with people like us. We want to associate with people like, people like us. It is a fundamental human need. Human beings are social animals. They feel uncomfortable in alien environment. Of course, we are adaptive. We are, you know, the sort of probably the most adaptive species on the planet. But the cost of adapting is high. But people like us should not be understood as members of a certain nation, of a certain ethnic group. What that people like us are not uh, are like us because what we, where we were born and so on. Nation comes from the same Latin radical that has given us the words nativity and naivety. Um, of the two struggles I mentioned, you know, beginning of this talk and so on, the horizontal and vertical one. 
dangerous one is the horizontal one. It's the struggle between nations. Nationalism is a danger. And nationalism trumps the vertical struggle between exploiter and exploited. Just two examples. In, on 31st July, 1914, 31st July 1914, you know what was happening there. A socialist, internationalist, pacifist member of parliament, Jean Jaurès, was shot in the back by someone called predestination, Raoul Villain. Villain. Um, he was acquitted by jury. He was acquitted of murder by jury. There was a war, pacifists were good to be shot. The USSR in 1941, the US Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, the only country in the world whose name doesn't give an indication of where it is geographically. The Union of Socialist Soviet Republic could be in the Andes, in Africa, <coughs> because that was how internationalist it wanted to be. Every country of the world would join the Union of Socialist Soviet Republic. So internationalist that when the Wehrmacht walked in, they declared the great patriotic war. Forget internationalism. This is a war about us against them. After the fall of the absolute monarchies, rulers were very clever to find a new legitima legitimation, a new foundation for their power. And they anchored it in nations. No more aristocracy, no more blue blood. No more blue blood. The only blood that flows through our veins is the blood of France, of Germany, of Britain. The <coughs> same blood that was spilled by our heroes, previous generation and the generation before that, and so on. It was this fantastic appeal that what Ernest Renan called a contract, a nation is a contract between the dead and the living difficult to negotiate a contract with the dead. You had it. And the illusion that the ruling class has created that we are all in the same boat, ladies and gentlemen. We are all French. And that entails sacrifices, such as military conscription, such as trenches in 1914, such as uh, bureaucracy, that has never been so intrusive, such as taxes that the kings would have never dared levy on his citizens. All could be done in the name of a nation. So no, no, for our own dignity, the people like us are not the people who behave like that. The people like us are heirs to a certain culture. That is a given of our human condition. We are born into a, into a certain culture, into a certain environment. We are transmitted a language, a, a set, a body of knowledge that allows us to navigate the world. I am passionately attached to my French culture but cultures are living entities. They evolve. They are not monolithic. I am French, but I have very little to do, very little in common with a fisherman in Brittany or a cow farmer in Normandy and, and so on. I have more in common with you, the people like us, other people in this room who speak English with different accents who may not have been born in this country, but we share certain values. We share, share certain virtues. And that is our people. I would say that is our nation, our fatherland, our motherland, 
our patriotism, if all these words did not refer to birth and therefore to destiny, whereas I suggest patriotism, that sort of patriotism, should refer to virtue, to commitments. The values that we want to defend, our Western values, are they not the universal values of the Enlightenment, the Declaration of Human Rights, the universal Declaration of Human Rights? And as Kant said, the cosmopolitan Kant said, um, all the people who respect other people's right are part of the same polity. They are all citizens. All moral person is someone that we want to live with. Not necessarily be a friend, but someone that we accept in the body that we call society. Thank you very much. Any questions, criticisms? Bob? Yeah. Uh, I voted for withdrawal from the European <coughs> Union because the European Union is aiming to become a nation <coughs> against, over and opposed to other nations. Is that I'm, wrong? Is that wrong? Yes. <laughs> because because it, it is obviously not a nation. It is a government, it might want to be a state, oh, well, but it was not a nation. A state. Well, yes, but with a big difference. And that is the difference precisely that I tried to emphasize in my talk. What would be the legitimacy of that state? I mean, if, for instance, you had directly imposed on you people of this country uh, rules about the curvature of cucumbers or how much water you could use to flush your toilet. People would have said, but when it comes from our parliament, from our democracy, sanctioned by the queen, we obey, we genuflect, we bow. Some do. Maybe, but most do. So that is a difference. The European Union might have been able, probably would have been able, to impose things like don't steal, don't kill, don't rape, don't cheat, because we more or less all agree on that. There are a few people who don't. But the rest was conveyed from the European Union via our own laws. It was and endorsed by our parliament. That's why it's so difficult to get out of it, because you have to reverse all these laws and things like that, but our parliament has sanctioned. I mean, our parliament, your parliament. So that is what gave it sanctity. If you didn't have that relay by the national parliaments, then the European Union could have done very little. People would have said, so the only thing that they could have imposed were things that generally common sense would have imposed. That's why European Union was not the danger. Nationalism is. Um, yeah, could you expand upon Then, Chris, uh, first of all, uh, Dominic, then Chris. Dominic. Could you expand, near the beginning you said all revolutions entail counter-revolutions. Yes. Could you expand on that? Do you think there will be a counter-revolution against the Populists. Well, the populists are a counter-revolution. So, um, and uh, no, I think that the populists are a counter-revolution. Yes, every revolution has a revolution. I mean, after the you know, 1789 revolution, you had Napoleon, you had the Restoration, and, and so on. But history continued. After the, you know, after all revolution, you have this counter. Now, what happens? is that history continues. And history, you don't need to be a Marxist to believe that history is driven, the engine of history is technology. 
it is the steam engine that gave you the bourgeoisie and um, sort of sapped the power of the landed gentry. And population pressure as well. Population pressure are working the other way around now because we have a declining population, certainly in the West and so on. That's why we have all the old people who normally would be dead, but they are voting. <laughs> so so um, what happens, of course, is that we are not going to unplug the internet. We are not going to reverse globalization. There are movements against it, but the pressure is there. And if the pressure is not sort of um, reignited or uh, comforted or supported by the sort of you know, nationalism and things like that, that will continue. Transnational businesses, um, China and, and so on, they are the forces that are pushing towards another world. We are not going to go back to the 1950s. History never does that. So, um, yes, let's bring it on. Bring on the, you know, the sort of uh, technologies that will defeat counter-revolution as rapidly as possible, probably in the next five years. Maybe the movement has already started you know, a very sort of reversal of the elections that people expected, you know, of populist movement in Austria, in the Netherlands, in France, and so on. So, um, and, you know, then we can, yeah, plunge into the future. Chris? Um, when you look at the, the votes you mentioned in particular, do you think there's an interesting dynamic that there's a significant amount of apathy involved? So during Brexit, I think, I, I can't remember the exact figure, I've seen uh, different ones, about 35 to 40% of young people was the amount that voted in the European referendum. So you see a significant amount of young people who just aren't that interested. The same in the French election, but Le Pen did worse than the number of people that didn't vote or abstained. And, and the same in the US election, I think it was 52% turnout. Do you think there then, is that an example of whereby people are rejecting both the narratives of this kind of national populism, but also the kind of loud, narratives of the kind of liberal cosmopolitanism on the other hand? Or do you think there exists there a kind of a multitude of people that are becoming more politically apathetic due to the technological developments of globalization? Yes. I think that people realize, more and more people realize, and that is what makes some people anxious, is that you vote left, you vote right, you vote for schmuck, you vote for Smith, same thing. It's not in their power. They come with these manifestos, these promises, I'll stop inflation, I'll you know, create millions of jobs, I'll do this, I'll do that. Very little happens. It's <coughs> not in their hands. We have to trust ourselves. Don't trust them, we have to trust ourselves. And we have to create the conditions <coughs> of society taking charge of itself and not letting states taking charge of it. And that is the positive news. You know, when people say democracy, 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 we want power. Well, take it. It's there. It's around you. Do something. Create a business. Create an association. Create a charity. Take care of your neighbors. Um, do all these sort of things. Don't wait for government to do it for you. Hey. Yes, um, you mentioned that the nature of the discontent, the causes of it, were different through different countries. Um, you also say that what they have in common is that it's discontent with modernity, um, uh, in whatever form it's taken. Um, I'm wondering to what extent um, it is the rate of change that people don't like, that they can accept change if it happens more slowly, but because it's happening so quickly, they're um, you know, caught, on, uh, caught out by, made, um, made to feel disempowered by, um, and uh, they feel uncertain about it. And um, it, when you answered the question about will there be a, uh, a revolution against the populists, I think that I agree with your answer that um, in a way you can't, because I don't see how the world is going to go slow. Um, or that the rate, I don't see the rate of change going slower either. I, I believe that it's remorseless, and that those who are 
sort of trying to be reactionary back to the days of their youth, whenever their youth happened to be, um, a natural world which no longer exists, are doomed to failure always. But they, the feeling's always going to be there. So it's, it's going to get more and more intense. They're bound to fail because they can't stop the world. But, they, but they, you can't stop them feeling like that either. Yes. And, yes, and the good news, as you said, is that the rate of change is going to accelerate. Mm. So um, it is um, something which I understand, you know, can be sort of a source of anxiety. And especially when you lose your job, especially when, uh, you know, you are 55 and you are not going to find another job, and especially if you were working in a steel factory and people tell you, why don't you learn coding, you know? Um, well, maybe, <laughs> you know? Um, so yes, there is a cost of that. And that is a cost of history. History takes no prisoners. History moves and crushes people. And it's very sad and we should act in order to support the people that are being crushed by history. But the people who try to stop it will inflict much greater hardship on people if they try to stop it. So you have only two possibilities. You can get out of history where nothing changes. You have societies, very small societies, in the middle of Borneo or the jungles of you know, South America and so on, where you have tribes with their culture, language, and so on, who have lived, who are living today as they lived 10,000 years ago. Nothing has changed. And anthropologists don't dare talk to them, don't dare approach them, because their culture is so fragile, it has no immunity. It hasn't had foreign germs. So it hasn't built an immunity system that if they meet the proverbial white man, they are going to decompose. Societies gain immunity by taking in foreign germs, by evolving, by changing. That is what makes them strong. And the idea that you can sort of hit back history is going to be defeated. Mm -hmm. back. I was just wondering, do you think that all the lessons that can be learned from nationalism have been learned? Because I don't see us unified on a global scale yet. And I think that until nationalism fails, even, like again, for this generation, uh, there will always be people who see uh, who don't want democracy to get out of people they can relate to. Like we're not at the stage yet. I feel that if I was voting with Chinese people, I would have a clue why they're voting the way they are versus the way I am. So I don't. I think there's still a need for nationalism until people are more similar. I hope they will not be similar. I hope there will yes. continue to be Chinese and French and Walloons and uh, Scots and, and so on. And I'll make a confession to you. I'm not <coughs> a Democrat. I prefer freedom. So I hope that there will never be something that you were alluding to, a world government. God forbid. It's bad enough to have a government of France, a government of Britain, a government and so on. But to have a world government, there is no escape. You know, you cannot hide. There is no place to... So, nationalism is an ism. It's political nationalism. It is a state grounded in a nation. It is... I'll say it in German, and you will understand it. <laughs> ein Reich, ein Volk, ein Führer. It is this idea of one people on a land with a boss, a head, a government, a state. 
That, I believe, has died at Auschwitz. That started in 1793 with the French Revolution. And there is an arc that goes all the way to the purest expression of the nation state. Purest expression of a nation without any of these foreigners, any of these Jews, gypsies, uh, migrants, foreign elements. The French, the Germans, the British. On the land of our ancestors, where we have our cemeteries, our monuments, our cenotaphs, and with our queen, our president, that is what is obsolete. Culture continues. And culture is exacerbated by globalization. Because in the 1900s, if you wanted to have a country that was viable, you had to have large enough a market to make your locomotive, your tractors, your engines, your, you know, all these sort of things. But when you can buy all these things from Korea, from whatever, Japan, from, you know, and so on, and sell them to wherever, you don't need a big market nationally and a state that controls that market. You need the world. Economically, you need the world. Economically, with globalization, you have the world. So therefore, you can be Basque. You can be Catalan. You can be Scot. You can be Welsh. You can be whatever. San Marino. So um, that is. I think, where you can reconcile the idea of we want to hang on to our language, we want to hang on to our traditions, but not make it political. Because if you need the state to protect your language, probably you should speak English. So, Are you? So, oh, sorry. Yeah. Big oh, David. <laughs> Oh, sorry. No, you. you, you so, 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 sorry, I, I thought it was next, time for next speaker. Well, next speaker is Leo. Let Christian finish. Yeah, yeah. No, I finished. Right? No, he said so. You're leading to a conclusion, Gary. Well, I forgot. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it will come back. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes. Right, I, I think I've got a lot to say here. Um, first of all, I totally agree with many of the things you say. I'm entirely in favour of the values of the Enlightenment. Um, and like you, I'm progressive. Which has been implemented. Um, that's indeed, yes. Um, and I'm certainly not a conservative or a little Englander. Um, and like you, I'm not a Democrat. However, um, I will have to confess that along with Bob, I did vote for leave. Um, there were You're main, forgiven. Yeah, there were two main reasons. One is I think the EU is unstable. The Greeks almost brought it down. Somebody will do. The Spaniards, perhaps, eventually, will just come down economically. And secondly, the EU project was missold. When that 1975 referendum happened, it was the common market. The common market morphed into the European Economic Community, and the European Economic Community morphed into the Economic Community, and the, economic, the European Community morphed into the European Union, and suddenly you lost the economic thing you thought we were saying yes to, and you've got instead, you've got the political thing. We didn't want. So that, those are my main reasons. Um, however, I'm coming back to the Enlightenment values. I think the political class in general, not just in this country, but in much of Europe, <coughs> is actually against Enlightenment values. They don't care about the rights of the individual. Look at me, this intercepting all our emails. Um, they don't care about truth. They don't care about evidence. They don't care about people. Um, the, the way that they do things is the agenda, their agenda is everything. Um, so, and, and that's not just the local ones, it's the EU ones as well. So, in a sense, it's already cool. Um, and there's one particular issue, um, which you didn't mention, I'm surprised you didn't, which is environmentalism. Now, deep green environmentalism, which has been driven by the UN, so it's part of your global globalization agenda. And I, I recently was looking at the back from 1987, one of the UN documents, and you could see that they came, 
um, internationalists and environmentalists got together and they made a thing which then went out in all directions and is a cause of a lot of the troubles we've got now. Um, is not deep green environmentalism the most conservative possible philosophy you could have? Oh, we mustn't damage this species, even one that we don't know exists. Um, uh, so, <laughs> there's a lot of questions. Um, just to, to conclude with what I'm saying, I think you're, you're right, the state is obsolete. I don't think the nation is obsolete. I think cultural nationalism is not obsolete. No, this um, is what I've, I've yeah, just said. Political yes. nationalism mm. is obsolete, yes. Mm. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. sorry. Well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, you made statements, not, not questions, but um, I can, um, on, on the one thing of the, you know, environmental issues and so on, um, I think there is, um, one aspect, which is, you know, I, I, I think which <clears throat> many people of, you know, say, a libertarian persuasion and so on, were um, wrong-footed. Um, what happened with this environmental thing is, uh, let, let's put it like that. Imagine that in your neighborhood, you have someone who hates travelers, gypsies, as they used to call them. Uh, you know, gypsies are thieves, they are rapists, they are, and so on. Um, and then there is a burglary. And that person says, I know who is a burglar. It is a traveler. It is a gypsy. I saw him. Hey, you doubt. Your first reaction is to question that witness. When you have people on the left, who for decades have said, we hate the big capitalists, we hate the old firms, we hate the, you know, sort of billionaires who have all these industries and so on. And then suddenly scientists come and say, you know, this is destroying the environment. I told you so. <laughs> then you start having the same reaction that the neighborhood will have with that neighbor waited, you know, it's too good. But actually, sometimes, that those witness <coughs> have it right. And <clears throat> they shouldn't be trusted on their first declaration, but I think there is enough evidence to say that they are actions that are destroying our environment. And we should take them seriously. Certainly. I don't want to go, this would be a whole new debate, what would be a sort of stateless environmentalism, a policy that would protect the things that we value, um, like pristine forests and all these sort of things, and species, um, but that, again, would be another debate. Point of information, though, on, on what Neil said, um, this Little Englander thing was, in fact, an 1830s label for the anti corn Law League on the fact that they were against the British Empire. <laughs> so, Little Englanders, they were against the British Empire. So it's most ironic that it's now being used just lately. Uh, I heard it in a, the other Christian, uh, you know, German Christian, uh, oh, yeah. wrote a, a, an article yeah. for the... Uh, and they used the word Little Englander in, in the sense that Neil was using it, mm. which of course is a you know, complete misunderstanding of, uh, of the position. The uh, Little Englander position is an anti-big uh, state position, yeah. anti-British Empire uh, position. Well, words but, change their meaning. But, but what I was going to say, uh, you, you No, it was a... Uh, well, this happened then, Pat. Yeah, thanks. Chris, I uh, good talk, as always. But, uh, I think the answer might be a lot simpler than you suggested. People, people have it tried, and they this idea, the traditional idea that um, first of all you protect yourself, and then your family, and then your village, and then your you know, region, and then your nation, and so on. And maybe your culture, your religion, and Christianity, Islam, and you expand <coughs> out, and you see the concentric circles is just weaker and weaker in allegiance. But uh, all these things are mythical structures, whether it's a religion or a nation or whatever. I mean, France. There's only a nation of comparatively recent composition, 18th century, maybe 
half the country spoke Lam Dok, no, not, not, not French. Uh, um, Britain is a composition of Celtic, French, plus various English Germanic islands. Germany itself is a composition of Franconian, Flemish, and Saxon settlers, and, and Slavs who are not even part of the same language family. You know. So the, the whole thing is, is completely it's nonsense. This thing about nation state is, is, was probably cobbled together by myth makers, say, 200 years ago, who did it for their own economic and power interests, is to con the people who didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And I think people start to sense that. They, get, they become contemporary, although people have different levels of education. We've all become sufficiently cynical in terms of you know, international media and the internet, so to realize that somebody's trying to put something over in the name of some myth of it. So we rather look after ourselves. At least we know that our own families are our own families, our own friends and societies are someone we know, whereas the rest of this stuff is all mythical structures, you know, nations, religions, and so on. People are reacting against it. Of course, the irony is that nationalists will tend to go for the most perniciously idiotic and transparently false things, like nations and religions, you know, religious truth, natural truth, which are the most obviously not true of all. Nevertheless, they're holding on to something because they don't know what to believe in. What to believe in. That's I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I have absolutely no respect for civilization, cultures, religion, language, all these institutions. I respect individuals. Yes, I, I and if a person tells me, look, for me, it is important to pray six times a day facing Mecca. It is important to follow five times a day. <laughs> um, it is important to you know, follow certain dietary prescriptions, to you know, do all these sort of things. And then I accept, not because I value their language, religion, and things like that, but because I value a person who tells me this is important to me. So it is. That's right. Yeah. So what I expect is that we would say, well, you know, when I tell them, look, I value other things. They say, fine, fine. You know, I understand that. So I think the idea, you know, the foundations of civilized life is that we agree to disagree. Yes. You know, we accept that we have different lifestyle and these lifestyles can cohabit if we abide by certain rules which are simply property rights, basically. Property rights in your body, property rights in what you own, oh. um, you know, for trade and gifts and things like that. And that's it. You know, then we can live all our different things and we congregate in various sort of associations and things like that, depending on whether we like music, uh, whether we are Christians practicing, uh, whether we are, I don't know, we, we, we speak uh, Catalan, uh, and, and so on. So we, we, we get together, you know, we trade, we have co corporations and charities and trade unions, you know, so we belong to various associations, not political. All these things are fine. The problem is when we become political. In other words, when someone tells you, I am the government, and the government says, you must speak French, or you must speak whatever, and you must believe that, you must practice this, you must, and so on. That is when the problem starts. This is the locus of the problem. David. Yeah, uh, Chris Hilliard, th th thank you for the lecture. Very good, very yeah. interesting. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, you, you, I, I don't agree with what you say it's in, in, in a nutshell. We agree to disagree. I think in a nutshell, your whole idea, very simply, rests on the idea that you can separate economics from politics, in mm. a nutshell. <coughs> and unfortunately, it can't be done. But most people have to find out the hard way that, that it can't be done. Now, I voted to, to leave you, and the reason I did so is completely the opposite to everyone else, and that was to save Europe from Britain. It makes sense given Britain's only uh, uh, career in Europe. Let me say that rather than save Britain from, M, from the British MEPs, so to save Europe from the British MEPs uh, rather than the MEPs. And well, I mean, I can give you many, many examples why I wouldn't have time. 
But in, in, just in a, a simple analysis, before Europe, before Europe was properly formed, the great libertarian heroes in Europe, like uh, Pigalle in, in France, in Paris, Kaiserstrasse uh, in Germany, Sachsenhausen in Germany, uh, Die Wallen in, in the Netherlands, I, I could name many all over Europe. They were bustling. Now, they've disappeared. Don't bother buying any books on this or searching through the newspapers to read about it. You won't find anything written about this whatsoever. Absolutely nothing. But I will tell you that... Oh, when, you find out? Uh, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a, because I'm, a, I, I'm a traveler and I worked all around you in the 70s, 80s and 90s. I would go over you, I would for Siemens, uh, British Telecom, so forth. But, but um, I can give you many examples of why you can't separate the two and why this European idea is dangerous. Economically, it's very good. Politically, ultimately, it will self destruct. They'll start fighting each other, no question about it. But I can give you one simple example I can come to, a very simple one. And you can Google this, incidentally. Mary, the Honeyball Resolution. That's a good one. It comes from Mary Honeyball. You've probably never heard of her. It doesn't surprise me. She's the MEP for London, one of, one of them. Um, I, I believe there's, uh, there's eight of them. Uh, Twelve in total, but eight core. But she's one of them, and she's the biggest noise. If you Google a resolution she put through the European Union, which was adopted by the European Union for all of Europe, and it's called after her name, the Honeyball Resolution. It's outlaws prostitution right across the European Union. Now this woman has never done a day's work in her life. She's an academic from Oxford. Uh, she's an academic from Oxford. And she's pushed this through, she's been adopted by the European Union. It, it's not enforceable yet by the European Union, but these, it's in a category where it will be enforced in the future, uh, right across the whole EU. Now, this is, these are the dangerous things where you're talking about when you, you're French, you, you like French customs, you want to go to France, you want to go to Holland, you, you want to go to Yugoslavia, see these different nations. Are you implying that I want to find prostitutes? <laughs> <laughs> I told you, it's a, it's a, it's a simple, I can give you a simple your example of where what's happening, <coughs> these cultures, nations, traditions are being utterly destroyed. And you're, having, you're just having one kind of society where it's happened even now. You go to different cities like Cardiff, uh, Berlin, uh, uh, France, or uh, uh, a lot of the major cities, and you see the same architecture, the same glass, the same laws, the same zombies. <laughs> The same McDonald's, the same, everything is, is the same. Is this leading to a question, Pat? Is this leading to a question, Pat? Come on. Say, well, that's wonderful. But, you know, it, 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 it isn't. It's anti diversity. Mm. Despite all the glossy brochures you read, it's completely anti to what they say they're doing. Yeah. Anti diversity. But, but it, you know, as someone said, it's, the, if you it's not the European Union, I mean, you cannot ascribe this to the European Union. Well, if you go to Hong Kong, if you go to you know Rio de Janeiro, you see the same sort of modern architecture because like in the Middle Ages and, or like in the Renaissance, you have an international style. Yes. I mean, a Gothic cathedral looks like a Gothic yes. cathedral, looks like a Gothic cathedral. Yes. And, uh, you know, Palladian villas in Italy and Palladian villas in Britain look like Palladian villas. So um, it's, you know, modern architecture. But the, archi the big architects today work internationally. Foster built you know, bills everywhere in the world and on the, the Reich, the British. And uh, yeah, all the, um, uh, you know, Kai Tak Airport and then all these sort of things. And, uh, you know, Frank Gehry and you name them. So, um, okay. Yes, okay, we pass. I'm going to be passed because there's other speakers. speakers. Oh, yeah. You can come back perhaps later. David? Uh, it, it's a point that you've heard from me before, but I'll um, say it again anyway because I might sound like my voice. But uh, the there is a certain irony in the framing of the whole debate as the forward-lookingness of globalization on one hand and the backward-lookingness of the reactionaries on the other hand. Because it might be said, actually, uh, that contemporary globalization is a very pale impersonation 
of what was a truly universal or nearly universal society in the 19th century, where you truly had freedom of movement, freedom of trade, a single currency, certainly in Europe and even beyond actually, in a way that we are nowhere near having now. True uh, communications are, of course, faster and better. But there are all sorts of impediments to true globalization now, introduced by governments that certainly weren't there 100 or 150 years ago. Yeah. Absolutely right. And the thing, of course, that derailed that globalization of the 19th century was nationalism. It was 1914. So, um, in other words, what we are trying to do is override that obstacle. So <clears throat> the populists are trying to, you know, we were sort of pushing down these barriers, and the populists are now trying to push them up again. I think you have to be careful with who the we is. Okay, well. Because, for example, yes, you, correct. you referred earlier to our values as being those of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Well, I might give you the first third of that document, but like, like kippers, it starts out okay, but the more you have it, the worse it is. And the back end of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a thoroughgoing collectivist document. Well, I was, I was referring to mine, the French one, the ah, 1789 one, <laughs> which, which of course, I mean, because I that, that is the one that is the Enlightenment. I do. Yeah, the, uh, you know, 1948 one is some, I mean, completely different document. Mine is the, yeah. John? Given that all right-thinking people, all six of us, right-thinking right right think right that where we want to get to eventually is private property, and anarcho-libertarianism. The problem is the best route to get there, and, and it seems to me the culture in which we find ourselves, not about choosing, but that's where we find ourselves, a certain amount of uh, tribalism and statism and very, very confused um, ideology is necessary. We can't leap over to where we want to get to. We've got to simply take the most plausible path. And therefore, I suggest that the most plausible slogan for our progress forward is Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Rand. <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah. We have to end <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, we can carry it on in the bar. Yes. So, so, do you, are you. No, I'm, I'm fine. I, I wish to thank you all. And uh, <laughs> no, no, no. thank you very much indeed. <laughs> it was very good talk. <laughs>